Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Thank you, Brother Jim. If you have your Bible, Genesis chapter 3. Um, before we do this, I'm going to pass out some assignments. Lee is a one-man band up there, so he's going to be running cameras and throwing verses online. So uh, I had a few that I want to use tonight. So I'm going to ask a few people to find a particular verse. And when I need it, I'm going to have you uh, read it for me. Um, so, uh, Braden, would you care to do one for me? Does that make you nervous? Uh-oh. Uh-oh. I don't want to make you nervous. I don't care what your dad says. Will you want to do that for me? You'll do it for me? Great. Uh, why don't you do Psalms 51.5? Psalms 51.5. Um, Wesley, you do one for me? Ephesians 2.1. Ephesians 2.1. Um, I need another one. A one verse. Um, <laughs> Zane's like <laughs> oh got you brother Bra, are you are, are you able young man you want to look one up for me no okay okay all right I guess uh, little Dave Castle would you do one for me <laughs> little Dave yeah, it, it's, it, I'm more worried about you remembering what I tell you. It's Matthew, <laughs> help him, Susie, Matthew 23, 27. Okay, and, and uh, this one's a few verses. Uh, anybody feeling brave? I need volunteers at this point before I run. Kirby, thank you, brother. Uh, Luke 18, verse 9 through 14. You got the biggest one in the group. Uh, I need another one. Anybody? 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 All right, Miss Ellen, I, you got Second Peter three, fourteen. Second Peter three, fourteen. Um, did I hear? First um, John one, eight and nine, and then I need one more. One more. All right, John, you can share. Help your. Sweetheart, you can do this one. First Corinthians, First Corinthians eleven thirty one. First Corinthians eleven thirty one. Now I gotta remember who I gave each one to. All right. If you're in Genesis chapter three and ready to read, say amen. Uh, let's begin reading. Uh, actually, I'm just going to have us read two verses, verse six and seven. Genesis three, verse six and seven. When 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 the woman saw that the tree was good for food, if you're with me, say amen. amen. That it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise. She took the fruit thereof and did eat. And gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat. And instantly, verse 7, and the eyes of them both were opened. And they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together. And made themselves aprons. Thank you, may be seated. Um, I was studying for this night, and I came across um, one of the men that I tend to read after often is Matthew Henry. He's a theologian or a Bible scholar from the 1600s. I just like the way he writes um, and his deep, uh, profound thoughts. I want, I want to just read... Uh, it's about three paragraphs here about this fall of Adam and Eve. He says, now when it was too late, they saw the folly of eating forbidden fruit. They saw the happiness they had fallen from and the misery they had fallen into. They saw a loving God provoked. His grace and favor forfeited, his likeness and image lost, dominion over the creatures gone. 
They saw their natures corrupted and depraved and felt a disorder in their own spirits of which they had never before been conscious. They saw a law in their members warring against the law of their minds and captivating them both to sin and wrath. They saw as Balaam, when his eyes were open, the angel of the Lord standing in the way and his sword drawn in his hand. And perhaps they saw the serpent that had abused them, insulting over them. The text tells us that they saw that they were naked. That is, first, that they were stripped, deprived of all the honors and joys of their paradise state, and exposed to all the miseries that might justly be expected from an angry God. They were disarmed. Their defense had departed from them. Secondly, in seeing that they were naked, that they were ashamed, forever ashamed, before God and angels. They saw themselves disrobed, of all their ornaments and ensigns of honor, degraded from their dignity and disgraced in the highest degree, laid open to the contempt and reproach of heaven and earth and their own consciences. Now see here, Matthew writes, first, what a dishonor and disquietment sin is. It makes mischief wherever it is admitted. It sets men against themselves. It disturbs their peace and destroys all their comforts. Sooner or later, it will have shame. Either the shame of true repentance, which ends in glory, or that shame and everlasting contempt to which the wicked shall rise at the great day. Sin is a reproach to any people. And lastly, see this, what a deceiver Satan is. He told our first parents when he tempted them that their eyes should be opened, and so they were. But not as they understood it. They were open to their shame and grief, not to their honor nor advantage. Therefore, when he speaks fair, believe him not. Um, We don't talk like that anymore. But it's beautiful to listen to. Somebody that God has gifted with the imagination and the understanding and the understanding of God's word that can convey to us what actually happened. You and I just read that their eyes were opened. Um, not their physical eyes, they already had them opened, their spiritual eyes, their conscience, if you will, that thing that we've been studying in Romans 1, that God hath showed it unto us. It's our insides. We know good and evil. It's the good we thought about. It's the good that Eve and Adam were hoping for. It's the evil that they hadn't planned. And tonight we we stop and consider at that moment in time when Adam eats. As we said last week, there's no indication whatsoever that when Eve ate, anything changed. Because it was said to Adam, God said, you should not eat of it. Eve knew of that pronouncement. But it was not to her God had said it. Matter of fact, God said it to Adam before Eve was ever created from Adam's rib. We'll learn later when we get to the, uh, the result of the transgression for each person's role in the fall of man, the serpent, the woman, and the man. We'll see in Adam as we study the book of Romans for by one man... Sin entered into the world and death by sin. So death passed upon all mankind for by one man's sin. 
When Eve ate, nothing changed other than she had this instant desire to not be alone in her fault. Something in her compelled her, gave her a desire to want to bring Adam into her failure. And as I mentioned last Wednesday, the most amazing part to me about this whole idea of what happened in the Garden of Eden is God gives us what we call five verses for Moses to write to us about Eve's transgression, not her, her, her deception, The New Testament, as we will see down the road, works hard for us to understand what happened. Deceive was Eve. Adam was not deceived. Adam's was pure rebellion, complete disobedience. He knew what he was doing. Eve was susceptible to to the temptations, the deceptions, the subtlety of the serpent. There is a difference. But as she brings Adam in, while Moses gives us, through the inspiration of God, what we call five verses, we know so much information about how the serpent got to her and what he said to her. And then we even get to watch her go to the tree and and, and we get to even explore her mind as she stands there and looks and contemplates. We know every thought of her mind. God gives us all this detail. And when it comes to Adam, all we know is... She gave it unto her husband, and he did eat. We aren't told what she said, how she said it, what promises she may have made. We don't know if she used the exact same words the serpent used on her, she used on him. But the Bible in the New Testament wants us to understand Adam is the transgressor, and he was not deceived. He was disobedient pure and simple. Rebellion. If if there is a good definition of sin that I would advise all of us to stick in our permanent memory section of our brain, the best definition of sin I've ever heard that makes it understandable to me is sin is rebellion against God. See, that covers both sides of sin. There are two sides to sin. The sin of commission, okay? Those are the sins we commit. That's the bad we do. That's what's called the sins of commission. That's when we go out and do bad things that we know God has said, don't do that. That's sin of commission. And it is a rebellion against God. The other side of sin is what they call the sin of omission. That means we know to do something, we know we're supposed to do it, and we still don't do it. It's not you're getting your hands dirty, it's you're refusing to get your hands dirty. Either way, when God says, I want you to do something, and you backsliding heifer, as the Psalms portray it, Lock up your front hooves, set your backside down, and refuse to be pulled any farther. Can you see that image in your mind? You can pull and tug and tug and pull. If that heifer's got any weight to her at all, you're not going to budge. She has decided she's not being loaded today. Amen? That is obstinance, stubbornness, rebellion. Rebellion against God is what sin is. In a moment in time, as Adam's teeth bit into whatever kind of fruit that was, instantly their eyes, not these, the eyes of their heart, their conscience awoke And just like sin had a slope to it, meaning she saw that the tree was good for food and and it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise. She went from seeing it to thinking about the pleasantness of it, to be thinking about the desire to make her wise. And then she took it, this progression, saw it, desired it, took it, and ultimately she did eat. Just as sin has a progression downward, all of a sudden, they've got something happening. 
all of a sudden they have knowledge. New knowledge. From the inside, not through the ears, through the inside of them, they know something. They're naked. They recognized their sin. What comes next? Emotions. They, they didn't just go, we're naked. Oh, well, naked it is. Apparently, there was some sort of emotion or feeling that came with this knowledge of sin. Those emotions and feelings became contemplation. It wasn't enough to go, I feel weird. Do you feel weird? I feel weird. I wish you would turn away. Something don't feel right. I feel weird. And then in them, something said, we've got to do something. Something needs done about this situation. And that causes action. They, they weren't content just to say, we're naked. Oh, well. They, they in their insides, knew they needed to do something about sin. Because that's the part of the knowledge of good and evil. When we have these conscience that God says that we know him. You can call yourself an atheist, an agnostic. You can, you can say you're anything in the world. What we all boil down to is God has put in us. He told us he did. This innate thing of we know we are sinners. Because the eyes of our heart cannot be blinded. We try. Believe me, we try. So tonight... I want us to talk about from the very first man and woman what human nature has been to do about sin. To do about sin. The first thing we really got to understand tonight is we are all born sinners. That's not my thoughts. That's not my opinion. That's what the Bible says, and nature proves. To me, the greatest evidence that we are born sinners, we were sitting around a table, eating at a funeral dinner, Jennifer and I were yesterday afternoon, and, and, and a man and woman started talking about their new grandbaby. And they said, do you know, how old did they say he was? Huh? Six months. Six months. Um, he said, you can already tell. We weren't even talking about sin. We weren't even talking about evil. We weren't even talking about church. We were talking about grandbabies. And the grandpa said, you know, I can already tell that little thing's a deceiver. That's what he said. He said, now he hasn't said any words or told any specific lies, but you can tell he's already knows how to convert attention another way. How many of you have been around children? I've said this so many times in my ministry. You don't have to teach a three-year-old to lie. You do not. Who did it? Amen. Not only lie, condemn. Right? Anything to get the attention off of it to the other person, especially if it's a sister, especially if it's an older sister, right? It's her fault. Any, anybody, we chuckle, but isn't it true? I mean, you don't have to do anything. There's not been a parent ever in history of humanity ever took their kid aside and said, listen to me. One of these days, you're going to do something wrong, and I'm going to come up and say, did you do it? And I want you to look at me and go, no. Because if you tell me yes, I'm going to have to beat you. And I don't want to beat you. So you look at me, and with all the convincing you can muster, I want you to, I want you to act like you've been to drama school. 
Even if you have the crayon in your hand and it matches the wall, I want you to look at me and say, I didn't do it, Daddy. I didn't do it. Now, if there is a parent that's ever done that, they need help. Amen? <laughs> but I'll tell you what every parent's done. Has got a kid in the car after they've thrown a fit over a toy in a store and said, you listen to me. That behavior will never get you a toy from me. Can I get an amen, you sassy mamas? Hmm? Listen, if you ever want a boot to the head, right, right. <laughs> I, 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 that's what we have to do. We have to say, you're not getting it till you say, thank you. Please. You're sorry. You go tell them you're sorry. We got to work at this. We got to rework this. We got to rework our rework to this. Amen? It's a constant fight to get kids to say yes, please, or no, thank you. Or to, when you get up from the table, take your plate to the sink. That's the least you can do. We made your dinner. We set it in front. The least you can do is pick it. Anybody with me? Say amen. I mean, children are idiots. First I brag they're here, then I start talking to them like this, right? I'm just confused, Zane. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, it's the way it is, isn't it? Uh, Braden, can you read me Psalms 51.5, brother? Psalms. All right, we'll jump to, uh, you ready now? You want to stand and read? That makes it even worse, right? Psalms 51.5. Thank you. Very well done. Let's give him a hand. Amen. Amen. How old are you, Braden? Ten. Ten. Excellent, brother. Iniquity is a tough word. I worried about that when I gave you that one, but you did well. And praise God for mama. Amen. Amen. <laughs> uh, Psalms 51. Great psalm, sad psalm. It's the psalm David wrote when Nathan the prophet came to him and revealed to him. It's what David wrote after he got caught over his sin with Bathsheba. And he comes to verse 5, what we know is verse 5, and he makes this infamous statement. He says, behold, I was shapen in iniquity. I was made, formed in sin. Not not the way he was conceived by mom and dad, but he understood in his being conceived, he was shapen in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. We were born sinful. The New Testament version that helps that out is Ephesians 2.1. Brother Wesley, if you'll stand and read that for me, brother. Amen. In the, in the King James, that's the verse that says, You hath he quickened, made alive, that were dead in trespasses and sins. That's the way we're born. We're born dead. We're born sinners. And I say this, I just said it a couple weeks ago, I, I am so redundant with the stuff that matters. This is why Jesus had to be born of a virgin. Okay, that was not God showing off. If he would have been born naturally like all of us were born through the offspring of a man, if Joseph would have been his real daddy, Jesus would have been born like the rest of us and he could have never been our savior. He had to be immaculately conceived. He had to be conceived of the Holy Ghost or he couldn't have been the sinless sacrifice of God because everybody is born a sinner. As, I, as it's been said many times and I like to repeat it, you did not become a sinner the day you sinned. You sinned one day because you are a sinner. All inclusive. There are no exception. There are none righteous. No, not one. Amen. All of us, are, our righteousness is as filthy rags. Adam and Eve didn't need God to say, you're naked. I told you you'd be naked. Now you're naked. God wasn't there to tell them. And Lord knows the serpent didn't hang around to tell them. 
They didn't need any outside influence to recognize what was happening on the inside. Amen? Do you know? I've been with me my whole life. I know. I don't need somebody to convince me I'm a sinner. Amen? I sinned in my lifetime a whole lot more than I care to admit. It's embarrassing. It's sad. And I'm so thankful none of you know the real Dean Warner. That the, the one that Paul writes about in Romans 7 when he says, I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. If you can amen that, I want you to. Amen. Well, you good people, I need to hang out with you apparently. <laughs> um, here's the first thing. Sin is known. I don't care what you say. I don't care what you think. We're all sinners. And that's why God gave the law. That's why he gives us these rules. Is so we can stop our mouth and become guilty before God. God needs you to know how guilty you are. Because you'll never come to him until you do. You'll never see your need of a savior. till you get a real good glimpse of your sin. And that innate part of you that says something about me doesn't deserve to go to heaven but I really want to which is a statement of faith in and of itself this recognition of an eternalness to you that faith that you do believe and that's the miracle of the thief on the cross is while he was dying he started that morning he was just like the other thief talking bad to Jesus and somewhere along the way a couple hours in it occurs to him he's about to die he understands he deserves to die he understood Jesus didn't deserve to die because he hadn't done anything wrong if he knew Jesus the Bible doesn't tell us that It was like all of this flooded him while he was on a cross. And then he had the audacity and the faith to say to Jesus. Where Jesus didn't speak to him once before this. He said, will you remember me when you come into your kingdom? He didn't say, "Uh, describe your kingdom to me. How do I know it's real? He didn't need any testimony. He didn't need any witnesses. Something in him said, I want to go where you're going. That means he didn't believe death was the end. He didn't believe Jesus was just another criminal. Something in him knew at a moment in time. Amen? Out of nowhere. It came to him. He is the answer. And Jesus looked back at him and said, if you can get off here and get baptized, you remember? You remember? It's not what he said, did he? Some of you are like, what? What? Maybe I shouldn't do that. I don't want to confuse people. But it's, it's silly. It really is to add anything to faith. It is by faith alone in grace alone. That a man will get, and this is the key, the righteousness of God. It's never been about your righteousness. It's about getting the righteousness of God. Because that's the only righteousness that can get in front of God. Is the righteousness of God. And it's when we simply believe enough to say, Me? Can I come with you? Can you save me? And Jesus said to him what he would say to any person that would do that. Today, you will be with me in paradise. Isn't that so cool? And I can't tell that story again and again and again without always saying again and again. Wouldn't you like to bend down there? Because Jesus went first. Remember, he was dead when they come and checked him. They had to break the thieves' legs for them to die. So Jesus beat him there. Right? So he gets to paradise and all these people are so excited to see Jesus. And he went, time out, just a minute. Hey, wait for it. Wait for it. Wait for it. What's up, dude? Right? Right? Today, you will be with me in paradise. It's just a few minutes. 
And he shows up. Can you imagine that reunion? Can you imagine that happy dance that thief did? See, that's when you know if you really believe or not. This stuff isn't just stories on a page. It is beautiful, the concept of sinners coming to a knowledge of sin enough to say, can you be mindful of me? He never started telling him, can I tell you how nice I was to my grandma? Can I, can I tell you how many people I've helped across the street? Hey, I'm not as bad as the guy over there, believe me. Believe me. He didn't start with that. He simply asked humbly, will you remember me? Will you do something for me that I can't do for myself? It's beautiful, isn't it? The first thing we need to know about sin is we know we're sinners. It's just this knowledge of sin has to come to a point of we know we need to do something about it. What's man's attempt to do something with sin? Because a lot of men because they know they're sinners, are doing something about their sin. They are. Um, there's two sides to what men want to do about sin. Adam and Eve uh, will demonstrate theirs first. Uh, they wanted to cover it up. That is man's natural propensity about sin. Cover it up. Right? They, they got this feeling of, you, you know, it's that proverbial sweeping stuff under a rug. If you can get it under there and cover it with a rug, and we've done this, right? I haven't done it, but you have, I can tell. <laughs> Hello? Yeah, I'm home. When? Now? Uh, okay. We'll be excited to see you. Mama, <laughs> they're coming, right? And it's the, get it, and we got, we're stuffing stuff in the closet, right, right? And the idea is, if, they, if it all looks good, maybe it'll be all right. My favorite is, I don't know where I read this first time, but it was the lady at the dinner table. Oh, by the way, honey, I forgot to tell you, I was driving today and a red light come on in the car. Which one? Look like a little oil can. I know this because my dad was, son, if you ever are driving in that, you got to pull over immediately, right? This is before cell phones. I don't know what he wanted me to do, but I was to pull over immediately. Uh, you, what did you do? She said, I fixed it. <laughs> How did you fix it? I took my shoe off and bashed the light out. <laughs> right, 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 right. Isn't that silly? You understand, Zane? As long as the light's not on, problem solved. We chuckle at that. But do you know that's what Adam and Eve did? They thought if they could cover it, it wouldn't be real anymore. Jesus said, little Dave, Matthew 23. Can you read that for me? <laughs> Thank you, brother. Listen to this verse. Thank you, brother. When Jesus was looking, and we, if, if you know anything about the Bible, and I never want to assume anybody in this room does. I love talking to novices. People don't know anything about the Bible. Scribes and Pharisees were the presumed closest to God on planet earth in Jesus' day. If anybody was on their way to heaven, it was the scribes and Pharisees. Pharisees had to memorize, not just know, memorize Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Memorize it. They had to study and study till they knew it. So it wasn't just knowing it, they had to practice it. Paul was a Pharisee. His father was a Pharisee. He says as touching the law, he was blameless. He knew it and he did it. That's the way he was. But he says, but I was still so unrighteous. Do you know why? Because he wasn't righteous at all. He was self-righteous. Right? It was his works that he thought was saving him. And when Jesus looked at the scribes and Pharisees, Matthew 23, that's getting close to crucifixion time. 
He says to them, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. And then he used a a mental picture to describe the reality of them. Did you get it? They are like white washed sepulchers. Graves. They're, they're like these beautiful mausoleums. And on the outside, they've painted them white. They've decorated them. And when you look at them, it looks so clean and beautiful. He says, but inside, you're full of dead man's bones. They got the outside looking right. But the inside is still Corrupt. That's man's propensity towards sin. It's how we think we fix it. As long as I can get it covered up. If nobody knows about it and if I figure out a way to live where it doesn't glare, it'll be okay. Oh, the American assumption. I do funerals all the time and you just can't talk people into believing this stuff. You can't. If God doesn't show up and arrest somebody's attention and they see it for themselves, you can't convince them of this. People don't think they're broken. Somehow they've convinced themselves, it's going to be okay for me. I know what the Bible says and I know what them loud preachers harp about, but I'm different. There's something about me God's going to be okay with. I join the church, I sing in the choir, and we start listing all of these. I'm telling you, works-based is man's idea for how to fix sin. And sad to say, most, not some, almost all Christian denominations are work-based salvation. They are. They are. I've said it this way. If you can do anything to get yourself saved or you have to do anything to keep yourself saved, your salvation is up to you. Now, you can take that home and process it all you want to, but that's the truth. If you did anything to get yourself saved or if you're doing anything to keep yourself saved, it's up to you. And then you got to answer, what's it up to? Okay, if it comes down to I got to keep myself safe because if I start doing this or that, I can lose my salvation. Who's it up to? Who's it up to? Who's going to get to heaven someday and God's going to put you on them scales and say, Oh, your good barely outdid your bad. Anybody that has this notion, it's a works-based idea. And it is absolutely wrong. It's what Adam and Eve did. The minute they knew they had sin, something in them said, we got to cover this up, we got to cover this up. And they looked around and there was fig leaves. And isn't it interesting, I didn't think of this. Somebody else I was reading made a point to this. I think it was J. Vernon McGee. Isn't it interesting that Jesus only cursed one tree in his old ministry? You remember? You remember, it was on his way into Jerusalem the day after the triumphal entry, the Sunday, the Palm Sunday before the Sunday that he rises from the dead. And he walks by a fig tree and he curses that thing. I almost said sucker again. That'd be two services in a row. I'm pushing it. I don't know why that word is prevailing in my mind. Must be hanging out with the wrong people. Uh Hang out with dogs, you'll get fleas. That's what my daddy said, right? Uh, Something in them said, you know how to sow? What is sow? (laughs) Uh, It just came to me. Sow is when you take something to bind other things together. Do you think we can do that? Sure. What do you want to sow? The biggest leaves we can find. What we go sow it with. Wouldn't you love to know what they sowed it with? But they put their hands to leaves and vine. And they, in the first degree, premeditated, thought it through. We have to do something. What is that something? And that's what they came up with. And man's been coming up with somethings ever since of how you find yourself okay before God. And it's all works-based. What can I do? You remember the rich young ruler? What can I do that I might have eternal life? It's what man thinks. What can I do? That's why it makes sense. If you don't do enough, you don't deserve to go to heaven. Um, The second is 
Who, Kirby, you got the longest one in the bunch, brother. Let's all give Curry our un, Kirby our Curry. <laughs> this just just listen. Amen. Thank you, Kirby. Uh, again, I'm going to presume nobody's ever heard that before. Jesus tells us, this is one of the parables. He tells us who he's talking to and why he's talking to them. He's talking to people who trusted in their own righteousness, self-righteous. And he began to tell this parable that two men went to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee, here we go again. The other one, a King James says publican, uh, Kirby's Bible pointed out what a publican is, a tax collector. Jesus is doing what he does a lot in his parables. He's, he's at two ends of the spectrum, getting them as far apart as he can. We have a Pharisee, and then on the other end of the spectrum, we have a publican. Uh, it's like the prodigal son. Jesus didn't just get him away from the father's house. He took him all the way to the hog pen. Jesus tended to do that. He wanted things to be as clear as clear can be. They couldn't have been more definable, wonderful, perfect, religious, God-honoring, God-like. Wow, what a man. And brr, sinner, extortioner, guy that robs people. That's what they were notorious for. You remember? You remember? That's, people hated him because they always took a little for themselves. These two men, these opposite ends of the spectrum, went to the temple to pray. And, and the Pharisee prayed first, obviously. And he thanked God that he wasn't like, and he pointed, apparently, this publican. Thank you that I'm not like this tax collector. I thank you that I'm not an extortioner. And you heard the list. He just went on and on and on about how great he was. And then the publican, after the Pharisee finally hushes, the Bible says he wouldn't even lift up his head. He just smote his breast and said, forgive me, I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner, I'm a sinner. And Jesus said, he, not him, he went to his house justified. The second way men have a propensity to think rationally about sin is as long as they can find somebody to point at and say, thank God I'm not like that one. As long as you can find somebody down the totem pole a little more sinful than you, you become more robust that if anybody's going to heaven, I'm sure beating that guy. It is concealment and comparison. That's how men justify their way to the presence of God. I can tell you, it didn't work for Adam and Eve, and it will not work today. You'll never get to God with fig leaves on. God will rip that off as soon as he sees it. Um, I'm out of time. But next week, uh, we'll talk about what God says man should do about sin. What man should do about sin. Oh, I hate quitting. I really do. I really do because sin is real. There's not one of us that don't have it. Um, can I have five minutes? Pretty please? Uh, at least I asked. Um, who was Second Peter? Was that you, Ellen? Can you do, can you do that for me, please? Listen closely. By the way, everybody likes St. Peter? I love St. Peter. I resonate with St. Peter. He was a bumbling idiot. He really was. But, but he became precious. And God became precious to him. This is five verses from the end of his life. 
This is the fifth verse before he writes four more verses and he rides off into the sunlight, sunset, and he's no more heard of and he dies. Crucifixion in Rome. This is his last words. This is his last real teaching words. Just read it, Ellen. Mercy. <laughs> Without spot and, did you catch the word? Blameless. What would God have us do with our sin? First of all, it comes down to the concept of blameless. Okay, not perfection. God never uses the word perfection. He knows better. He knows us. Amen. Um, he knew us before we ever knew him. Before the foundation of the world, I was chosen in him. Uh, but First John, First John, who had First John? Is that you, Linda? Nope, nope. Is it? Awesome. 1 John 1, 8 and 9. If you don't care to stand, be careful with that shoulder. Uh, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. Stop right there. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. Okay? That means God knows you're a sinner. Problem is, is we don't think we're sinners by comparison. Self-righteousness. Now, in the Old Testament, what did men do with sin? Do you remember? They took animals to the temple or to the tabernacle and they offered those, right? Right? Where did those rules come from? Who gave the rule to bring animals to the temple for sin? God did. Moses didn't come up with that. God came up with that. He said, when my people sin, this is what I want them to do. You know what this tells me? God knew we would sin. In the Old Testament, it was clear. This is what you do with sin. In the New Testament, he says, if anybody says they have sin, they're a liar. This is God telling us, I know you're a sinner. Stop lying. Okay? And the truth's not in you, is how verse 8 concludes. Verse 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Very good. Uh, if you've been in church much, that is a familiar verse. Baptists really like it, right? Uh, if we, what's the word? Confess our sin. If we confess our sin, he is faithful, faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from most unrighteousness, right? Right? I love that. I like it when you catch me. It's not most unrighteousness. He doesn't forgive us for most unrighteousness. He forgives us for all unrighteousness. The key is confession. Do you know confession is a part of salvation in the beginning, right? Romans chapter uh, 10, verse 9 and 10. If a man will confess with his mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in his heart, God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved, rescued from perishing, delivered from sin. It takes confession to get saved, and confession is how we lived this salvation that God gave us. We are constantly confessing our sin. The last verse, Brother John, if you don't care to re read that for me, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 31, I believe it was. Yes. This is confession. Thank you, brother. Thank you, Miss Linda. Uh, if we'll judge ourselves, we won't have to be judged. Here's, if, if Adam and Eve would have said, do you feel something? <laughs> I feel something. I feel different. Do you feel different? And if they both would have said yes, and Eve would have looked at Adam and said, what should we do? And Adam would have said, I really don't know what to do, but I really think it was something I ate. <laughs> Man, isn't it awesome to be here tonight, huh? Right? I think it's something I ate. Uh, and, sh and he would have said... God don't normally come this time of day. But let's go see if we can find him and ask him what happened. He told us if we ate it, this would happen. We didn't understand die. We thought it meant we would cease to exist. But apparently that's not what die means. It's more of a separation than an end. I feel separated. And I don't like to be separated. Let's go find him. 
And this first man and wife should have grabbed hands and ran into the presence of God and said, We messed up. We messed up. We messed up. You say, Dean, what would God have done? We'll never know. But we know this, he's faithful and just to forgive sin if we'll confess it. I'm not going to paint a script that I have no right to paint, but the truth is the truth. God is, remember, we studied a couple weeks. What did he tell Cain? Why are you angry? Go do the right thing and I'll accept you. That's the God I serve. He's loving. He's kind. He's long-suffering. It's the whole reason he hasn't blew the, blew the trumpet yet is because he's long-suffering. He's not willing that any would perish, but all would come to repentance. The only reason he hasn't come yet is because he wants more people to come to him. He's a loving God. He's a gracious God. He's not a liar. He tells the truth all the time. He is righteous and just. And he can. He has the ability and the authority to forgive you of your sin. But you got to, if you'll humble yourself, he'll lift you up. If you'll crawl up under God and say, God, I have wronged you. I am a sinner. I have lived my life for me. I have lived it for my pleasure, my goodness. I haven't given you one thought or consideration other than I don't want to go to hell. But really, it's not been about you. It's been about me and all about me. It's all about me. My whole life's about me. God, I'm tired of living for me. I recognize my faults and my failures. I come to you for grace. I need the every hour, most gracious Lord. No tender voice like thine can peace afford. I need thee, oh, I need thee every hour. Mo bless me now, my Savior. I come. I've always loved that song. Even as a young person, I just love what it feels like. Do you know why? Because we're not singing about God in that song. I'm singing to God in that song. And I'm saying what my heart knows. It's not words on a page. It's not a great song written by Annie Hawks back in the 1800s. It is an expression of my heart. I need thee every hour. The second verse, I wrote it down, says this. I need thee every hour. Stay thou nearby. Temptations lose their power when thou art Nah. Do you know what confession is? Confession is, God, I need you. I done blew it again. Anybody here ever had a kid come and own something? We've talked about the honoriness of children. I'll tell you the blessings of children is when they start a sentence with, Mom, Dad, I need to tell you something. I don't know about you. We can get through anything with that heart. Grace, mercy, forgiveness just rises up before I ever hear what they've done. Because of the way they've come. It's sincere. They're not trying to get out of something. They're trying to own something. They're tired of being separated because of what they've done from something they love. That is confession. Honestly, it's missing God. It's missing God. It's wanting God back. Do you miss God tonight? Mm, If you're a child of God and you're not where you ought to be, there ought to be something in you almost wants to blurt out loud, I miss Him. You better believe I miss Him. Like a 76-year-old man having to lay his precious wife of 50 years to, 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 to the ground. If I would say, do you miss her? He would scream out, oh, I miss her. 
I miss God when I'm the one who runs away from God. That's what God wants man to do with sin. He wants him to recognize it, hate it, and miss him enough to come judge themselves and say, God, I pick you over that stupid pleasure. You matter more to me. God, as I come to you now, I thank you for your word. I thank you how you teach us and guide us and direct us. I thank you how you make us feel sometimes. We can't live on feelings, but I thank you for how we feel sometimes. This genuine expression of our heart that says, man, I'm glad you're part of my life and I'm so glad I'm a part of yours. God, help us all. Lord, if there's somebody in this room that's never been saved, I pray that if nothing else tonight... They sense you love them. They sense that they've been uncovered tonight in a way that they're exposed before you. And even though they feel exposed before you, they don't feel ashamed. They feel loved. They can sense you want to fix that, not judge it. You want to take care of it. You want to bring mercy and grace to their life, not judgment or condemnation. May they sense that. Your true nature your true character toward your children. And God, may they, in that confidence that you love them, may they come as a wayward soul missing you, longing for your presence, longing for fellowship with you, longing to feel close to you, longing to feel comfortable in your presence. God, may you not just be an idea to us from this day forward. May you be real to us. And Lord, I pray that if there are people in this room that call themselves Christians, but as they hear those words being said, this idea of closeness, this idea of companionship, Lord, if they're missing that, Lord, help them to miss it. And long for it. God fix us. So we can be used of you. In these last days we live in. We ask this in Jesus name. And all God's people said. Amen. Amen. Listen. If you want to be saved. If you want to talk to God tonight. You don't need an invitation. You don't need me to give you permission to go to that altar. You can get up and go anytime you want to. Just do it. But if you need us after church, don't you dare hesitate to grab us. We would love to talk to you about anything you need to talk about. Um, Here's quick announcements. Trent's address out there. Julie wanted me to mention. um, This seems so meaningless after a service sometimes. uh, Decoration for VBS. Um, From next Tuesday, from 1 to 7 in the evening, anybody and everybody, come as you will. You don't have to stay the whole time. If any time during that, you can come for just a couple hours. We want to start decorating our church for all these kiddos at Bible school. So if you have, if you have a, a desire, a want to help that day, please come. Uh, you don't have to be crafty to do it. They'll tell you what to do, I'm sure, um, and show you how to do it. They just looking for people who are willing to help. So this is a great way. If you want to know what kind of church we really are, come work with us. Come work with us. That scares me to say that out loud, but uh, I have confidence. You'll be glad you did. Close ministry the 14th of July, uh, the 16th, that Saturday before the the VBS starts from 9 a.m. If next Tuesday doesn't get done, that Saturday's going to be our final push to get decoration done. Um, So that Saturday at 9 a.m., we'll announce what's going on if that still needs to be. VBS starts July 17th. And don't forget, kiddos, obviously, we want you here. Adults, don't forget, it's casual revival for us. Okay, we have a meal. You don't have to go home and get food. You can come straight here after work, get something to eat. And it's not junky food. It's good stuff. Um, come get a bite to eat and then we'll come in here just like we are tonight, this back section, and we'll have us a casual revival uh, and talk about the Lord. So when's the last time you was in church five nights in a row? I promise on Thursday you won't be like, yes, you'll be sad it's over. I promise. I promise. Um, 
Crowdale, the 31st. Out, out there is going to be our outdoor evening service from 6 to 8. Um, make sure you plan on that. Hospice help. I haven't anybody mentioned to me they might be interested in being a sitter for the hospice of Mason County. If you've been thinking and praying about that, let me know. Uh, food pantry this month is Little Debbie. Um, we haven't delivered that yet, right? Okay. Little Debbie Cakes, the mission group of the month that we're taking this special offering for is the Gabriel Project. Uh, pray for salvations. Pray for our new sister in Christ, Miss Vicki back there. We're thankful for you, Miss Vicki. We really are. Appreciate you being here tonight. Uh, I'm sorry. Amen. Amen. And pray for Bob Pauley and pray for VBS. All hearts and minds clear. Thanks for giving me an extra 15 minutes. <laughs> Ask for an inch and take a mile. That's Dean for you. Let's all stand.